I started working at my family's pizza shop when I was 13. At times it can be a little bit challenging, but overall I just love being a part of my staff. I worked at my wife's pizza parlor um, when we were in high school and we were dating at the time. Easton loves the pizza parlor. He loves to run around. It's like a big playground for him. Easton is always, he's always happy, he's always smiling, he's always laughing, even before he got sick. If something knocked him down, he was just ready to, to get up, smile, laugh, playful. Just overall, Easton is fearless. Everything was good um, with Easton as a normal, healthy infant. Then he started to get these fevers um, once a month. I just had a gut feeling that something was wrong, and so we took him to the ER at Pittsburgh Children's. And at that point, they had felt his belly at the time. And I would make comments to my wife here and there about, you know, hey, does his belly look a little, like, bloated? He's our first baby, we didn't know any better. Um, but at that time, that night we were in the emergency room, they had said his spleen was enlarged. It took a little bit of time, but finally came down to our final two potential diagnoses. Nothing prepares you for anything like that. So when it comes, it hits you like a train, especially something that is so fearful, like a cancer. It was really tough to hear. My name is Kayla, and my son Easton has HLH. HLH stands for hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis. And um, it's this really long name uh, that is descriptive of this sort of appearance that was recognized, you know, over 75 years ago, in, uh, first in children, uh, that there would be this unusual situation of low blood counts, fevers, enlarging liver and spleen, and uh, on a bone marrow biopsy, uh, there'd be this appearance of macrophages eating all kinds of cells. And that's what, literally what hemophagocytic means. It means blood-eating cells. You could describe it as a genetic familial immune regulatory disorder. Uh, and in those individuals, there's an off switch in the immune system that's broken. And without that off switch, when the immune system turns on, it doesn't know when to stop. In order to diagnose HLH, you can do one of two ways. Either the genetic panel, which we did find out about six weeks after his diagnosis, or you can diagnose it based off of criteria. I believe it's if you have so many symptoms, then you can start treating and diagnose HLH, which is what was done immediately in order to start treating with steroids. Prompt diagnosis is really important. The immune system of somebody uh, with HLH is prone to sudden um, sort of severe bouts of inflammation. He became sick within less than six months of age with fever, uh, an enlarged liver and spleen and low blood counts and other signs and symptoms of HLH, which told us that if he didn't get immune suppression very, very rapidly, that it would quickly spiral out of control. So many of these children, I won't say majority of them, but a, a large fraction will end up in the ICU, sometimes with um, you know, um, organ failure of some sort, needing, um, um, you know, needing a lot of support. When Easton was diagnosed with HLH, I immediately joined a Facebook group for HLH, and every single mom in there raved about going to Cincinnati, and you had to go to Cincinnati to get treated the best in the country. Easton came to us already having been uh, diagnosed at an outside hospital, 
Uh, and in fact, it was already clear that the underlying genetic cause, and his case was, uh, you might say, classic in terms that he presented as a young infant. Unfortunately, he inherited a mutated copy of a gene from each parent. When they told us that we had a 1 in 50,000 disease, I was one of those people that just didn't believe it. I said, no way could my healthy baby be this super sick, a disease that's going to be fatal within months to two years. I just thought, no way. But the genetic panel did come back, and he had that. Put your arms up. Arms up. It's so hard to believe that, you know, this little baby who was just at home on playing on his belly, uh, smiling, laughing, could have such a diagnosis. So um, I think we're, we were both in denial that this could um, potentially be our reality. Put your arms in. Put your arms in. Okay. This is actually a highly fatal disorder. So historically, say more than 30 years ago, most children did not survive. Uh, it was really only starting in the 90s that physicians began to understand how to treat these patients. Most often a child will be diagnosed, will be admitted to the hospital, and you know after they receive immunosuppressive therapy for typically some months, uh, if a child has an inborn genetic cause of their HLH, then that, that needs to be corrected. And the way you correct that is to give somebody a completely new immune system from somebody else. And the child would undergo bone marrow transplant from that donor. Uh, and since your immune system comes from your bone marrow, uh, as that new bone marrow takes root, then you really develop a brand new immune system that doesn't have this sort of fatal flaw in it. We began the process of looking for a donor. After we found out that there were no usable unrelated matches, Dr. Jordan tested myself and my husband. I came back at a 5 out of 10 match, which most parents do, and Eric came back at a 6 out of 10. So we automatically knew Eric was going to be the donor. The bone marrow is sort of liquid in a living individual, so a significant amount of that is drawn out. Uh, now what we take out from the patient quickly regrows in the patient. It's just like trimming your fingernails or cutting your hair. It just grows back and refills. Leading up to transplant, I was getting all the pictures I could get of Easton and just taking in all of those moments because you just don't know what's gonna happen after you go into the hospital and you go through transplant. You don't know if you're gonna walk out with a baby or not. The morning of transplant was pretty hectic. I went with Eric and Eric went into surgery and he had come out around noon and then around, I wanna say 6 p.m. that day, Easton received his, his life-saving cells. When Easton cells started to take his breathing started to really decline. So we had to go to the ICU for him to be put on a BiPAP machine to get his lungs um, and his oxygen back up to where they needed to be so he could breathe on his own power. After the ICU, when we moved back up to the transplant floor, um, he continued to just progress in the way that you should after a transplant. He continued to recover and all the way up until the celebratory day 100, which means that you are pretty much beyond all of the serious complications of transplant. We were able to move back home to Pittsburgh and since then Easton has just been a crazy, active, busy toddler. Once he learned how to walk, I, he runs everywhere, he goes everywhere and um, he's just, he's happy. Occasionally, we have had to go for boosts um, to keep that chimerism in place, but um, overall, that has no effect on his prognosis. <laughs> I'm very hopeful for the future. We've had um, a, at least a couple new therapies in the last five years. I think that that is only going to improve uh, in the next five to ten years.
Where's the baby at? Mommy's daddy. That's not We've gone through it and we made sure before we started planning for a second child that we'd be ready for anything. If they're in this 25%, then we have a whole team waiting for us and Dr. Jordan won't be getting rid of us. Easton is going to be a big brother and so we just can't wait to watch him take on this new role and this new big brother, all the big brother tasks that come along with it, and being a sibling and growing up with a sibling, we just can't wait to to grow our family and just continue on to everything that we had seen before his diagnosis. I'm very hopeful for the future. I'm very hopeful, very at peace, and, and very happy with where we are.